Hi there, everybody. Thanks for joining us again. We're going to give everyone a couple of seconds to get logged in. I know it always takes a couple of minutes for everyone to get settled and ready. Very excited about today's media briefing. We have some really high profile people joining us today, which as I said, is really exciting. And I'm happy to see. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm doing a media thing. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And that's what happens in the world of COVID with real life and work happening at the same time. All right, so with that, uh, I think we've seen the numbers settle off a little bit. So thank you again to everyone for joining us on this, our latest media briefing on important healthcare issues in the news today. As everyone knows, I'm Dr. Samantha Hill. I'm president of the Ontario Medical Association, and we represent more than 43,000 doctors and medical students across the province. This week, we're here to talk about big data. What is it? How does it change the way the healthcare system works and will work? How does it change predicting and improving patient outcomes? Big data is the term that we use to describe the huge volumes of information collected routinely during medical care. There's so much information collected that it's impossible for any traditional technology to make sense of it. But with modern computer, computers and other digital technology, we can mine that data to discover trends predict which patients will need what level of care, and ultimately improve patient care and outcomes. It means that physicians and healthcare planners have a new way of accessing reliable, solid evidence on which to base their decisions. Big data began in places like airline and retail industries, which wanted to better understand their customers and what they were buying and improve their profit margins. And that early use of big data is exactly why companies like Amazon can now deliver a package to you the same day you order it, or Facebook knows what you ordered or will order the day before you do. Healthcare is really one of the last industries to adopt big data. And in a large part, that's because we were making sure we were protecting patients' personal health information as we went. Today, I'm really excited to have three esteemed physician colleagues with us to describe how healthcare is embracing big data, to give us some concrete examples of how it is working to improve efficiencies, often in ways that lower healthcare costs and in ways that improve outcomes. And that of course is the most important part, delivering the best possible care for patients. Our three panelists are Dr. Jane Philpott, who hardly needs any introduction. She's a family physician, a formal federal health minister, and now serves as the Dean of Queen's University Faculty of Health Sciences and the Director of the School of Medicine. She's also a special advisor to the Ontario Health Data Platform. Drs. Fahad Razik and Dr. Amol Verma are internal medicine physicians at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. They are the co-leaders of Gemini, the largest hospital-based clinical data network in Canada, which extracts data generated as part of routine medical care and uses it to improve patient care. Dr. Philpott, I'll turn it over to you to start with your thoughts on big data, the benefits of it, and an update on the Ontario Health Data Platform. Thanks very much, Dr. Hill, for the introduction. And I want to thank the Ontario Medical Association for hosting this gathering and inviting me to be part of the conversation today. This is indeed a, a critically important topic and the reality of the pandemic has made it uh, more important than ever that we discuss issues around big data and health, the opportunities and the challenges to make the most of big data for the benefit of the people of Ontario and beyond. Doctors have been using data to make decisions since medicine ever began, whether it was something as simple as checking the pulse rate on a patient and monitoring that over a period of time to checking a patient's blood pressure. That is how doctors make decisions based on the information, the data that's available to us. That's what we do. But there's never been as much health data available as there is today. And the amount of health data that's available to physicians and other clinicians as they make decisions about their patients is growing at a rapid rate. 
We have now, of course, very intensive details through medical imaging technologies, increasing amounts of details through laboratory information and pathology specimens. And patients are monitored from the time they start interacting with the healthcare system and even before. The problem has always been how to get all of that data, as much of it as possible, into one place so that doctors can make decisions in real time based on, his, on the best possible information and figure out how to use that information again in real time on the front lines of care. Today, you're going to be hearing from two of uh, the, the best in the business in terms of how to use big data in healthcare decisions. And I'm really honored to be part of this panel, along with both Dr. Razak and Dr. Verma, who have been developing the Gemini Network, along with a number of hospitals and clinicians across the province in an ever-expanding network. They are going to give you some fantastic insights as to how this kind of information can actually make a difference in decision making and allow us to be able to make determinations as to the outcomes of a patient of patients in ways that we've never been able to before. They can predict who is at most most at risk and who needs to be uh, receiving a particular type of care or a particular type of attention within the system. I've been invited to be part of this panel in part, uh, of course, because of my role in academic health sciences at Queen's University, but also because I've had the privilege for the last seven or eight months to be advising the provincial government, specifically the Minister of Health and the President of the Treasury Board on the development of something called the Ontario Health Data Platform. This was first announced by the province back in April of 2020 when it was described as Panther. The, the name of the project very quickly changed to, to the Ontario Health Data Platform. It was triggered in part by the pandemic, although the concept of putting together a health data platform of this magnitude has been something that was discussed for a very long time. And this is one of the positive legacies of the pandemic that it is, has encouraged us, motivated us to move forward together on being able to develop concepts that we always knew were a good idea. And so the Ontario Health Data Platform has been developed perhaps in, in, in fairly quiet ways in the background. It's been an enormous amount of work. I've served not only as an advisor to the ministers, but as the chair of the Joint Ministers Roundtable, which again advises the development of the platform and looks to how it can be done most effectively. When it is complete, the Ontario Health Data Platform will be the largest collection of data, health data sets in the entire country. And it will allow not only the gathering of data that we've had together before in uh, systems like the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences that has been a wonderful platform for researchers to be able to gather administrative data about healthcare, but the, the Ontario Health Data Platform is also going to allow us to be able to add in, for instance, information about vaccines, who has received them, and which kinds of vaccines have been received. It will ultimately also allow the, uh, the melding of the, those pieces of administrative data with the kind of data that Dr. Razak uh, and Dr. Verma are going to be talking to today. Uh, the electronic medical records are health information systems that are available to patients uh, that are available as to uh, following patients during their journey through hospitals. The platform will also ultimately be able to include the electronic medical records that are available from primary care providers, for example, and eventually in its, in its uh, final form will include some of the most sophisticated pieces of health data that we have, including imaging, pathology, genomics, and more. This, the opportunity of this is to be able to have all of these pieces together in a platform that is safe and secure, that will allow not only researchers and data analysts and policy decision makers to be able to understand more about uh, the, a patient's journey through health systems, but that ultimately it will be able to provide insights that you're going to hear about today in terms of how people will actually make different decisions on the front line. And it takes place in a high performing computer environment that will allow sophisticated uh, 
computer technologies of artificial intelligence and machine learning in a way that we've never been able to do before. So uh, I look forward to your questions. And most of all, I look forward to the presentation of my colleagues, which will uh, announce to you some of the really important work that they've been doing through the Gemini Network. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Philpot. It's so interesting to hear where we're going with that and how it's going to direct our future. We're all very excited, I think, in, in the medical world to take on this next big step. Speaking of things that are really exciting, uh, Dr. Rozick and Dr. Verma recently published in CMAJ, the Canadian Medical Association Journal, a really fascinating study comparing the outcomes of patients who were hospitalized with COVID-19 during the pandemic and those who were hospitalized with the flu. Dr. Verma, can you speak to us a little bit about that? Absolutely, thank you so much for the uh, very kind introduction, Dr. Philpot and uh, Dr. Hill. So we uh, are delighted to share with you our work that we've developed through Gemini. As uh, Dr. Philpot mentioned, this is a, a network uh, of hospitals and clinicians uh, that is uh, developed a hospital analytics laboratory, harnessing data science to improve hospital care. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So about five years ago, Dr. Razak, myself, and a number of our colleagues across uh, Toronto and Mississauga recognized that we didn't have detailed clinical information that could inform us about the quality of care we were providing to our patients in hospital. So we started developing Gemini. We created a partnership of seven hospitals initially to share data and provide information that frontline clinicians and that hospital administrators and health system leaders could use to understand and improve the quality of care. So we had seven participating hospitals at the beginning of the pandemic. And when you know, the pandemic hit, everyone came together to recognize the need for sharing data. And our network was accelerated from seven hospitals to 30 hospitals across Ontario who came together saying, we need to collaborate. We need to share information about our COVID patients, about the care for other patients. And that network now includes about 65% of Ontario's hospitalized patients. We hold data for more than 400,000 patient admissions with billions of data points. And it's now Canada's largest hospital clinical data platform that allows us to do really leading research as well as quality measurement and, and frontline quality improvement. And we'll share with you some of the uh, findings from that network today. So the next slide. So the, the study that Dr. Hill mentioned is, uh, was looking at uh, patients hospitalized with COVID-19. And we really had three aims. The first was to describe what happens to patients when they're hospitalized for COVID-19 in Canada. It hasn't been published yet. A large study looking at what happens to people when they end up in hospital with COVID in Canada. Secondly, we wanted to debunk the myth that COVID-19 is not more severe than influenza. And then finally, as we've talked about before, the power of big data, we want to explore whether we can predict who might die from COVID-19 in hospital. Next slide. So what did we do? We used the Gemini database to collect electronic clinical data from those seven hospitals across those organizations that I initially mentioned in Toronto and Mississauga. We collected information about all medical and ICU patients uh, during essentially the first wave of the pandemic. So we studied just over a thousand adults with COVID-19 and, and compared them to 780 adults who were hospitalized with seasonal influenza. This represented about a quarter of all hospitalizations for COVID-19 in Ontario at the time. So just to give you some highlights of the key findings. So the first was who is getting hospitalized with COVID-19? Well, the patients tended to be a bit older, median age was 65, but importantly, one in five of the hospitalizations for COVID occurred in people less than 50 years. We, uh, uh, the, the patients were prim primarily male. We know that COVID-19 affects men more severely. We know it affects people who live in long-term care. We know that it affects people who have comorbid illness, like hypertension and diabetes. And uh, we also know it affects people in lower income neighborhoods. And certainly those are all things that we found in our study. Next slide. So when we looked at the outcomes of what happens to people when they're hospitalized for COVID-19, there is no question this is a very severe illness. So the median hospital stay is nine days when you uh, are hospitalized with COVID-19. One in five patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19 died in the first wave of the pandemic. One in four received intensive care. One in five needed a ventilator. And nearly one in 10 of the people who survived to discharge required an unplanned readmission within 30 days of discharge, just pointing to the long-term effects of COVID-19 that we know exist beyond mortality. Next slide. 
So we talk a little bit about the comparison with influenza, and there is now definitively no question that COVID-19 is much more severe than influenza. Ours is one of uh, a small number of studies around the world that has been able to directly compare COVID with influenza. And we found that patients hospitalized with COVID-19 had three and a half times greater in-hospital mortality, had one and a half times greater need for intensive care, and stayed in hospital one and a half times longer than people with influenza, even after you adjust for other patient factors like age and, and coming from a long-term care facility. So there is no question COVID-19 is more severe. The next main point to highlight here is looking at age gradients. So on this graph, what you can see in blue are the people less than 50, in yellow, people who are 50 to 75, and in orange, those who are greater than 75 years. The major takeaway here is that COVID-19 is more severe in older adults, but still very serious in younger adults. So let me draw your attention to the orange bar in the category of death for those over 75. So of people over 75 who were hospitalized with COVID-19, 40% of them died in hospital. That's nearly one in two. Obviously that is a staggering statistic and there are very few other acute illnesses that have that level of mortality. I now wanna draw your attention to the younger age group because one of the things we hear in public health communications in, in you know, the general understanding of COVID-19 is that this is primarily a disease of older people. And our study shows that is just definitively not true. Adults under 50 years accounted for one in five of COVID-19 hospital admissions. Of those, nearly one in three, 30%, required intensive care. Surviving intensive care comes with a whole host of attendant long-term complications that these people are then you know, living with. One in 10 of these younger adults were readmitted unexpectedly after discharge from hospital and a staggering one in 20 died in hospital still. When you think about people under the age of 50, you know, you would never expect one in 20 to be dying from an acute care COVID. So, you know, the major takeaway here is yes, COVID-19 is more severe in older adults, but it is still very serious in younger adults. Next slide. The final goal of our project was to see, can we predict in hospital mortality with COVID-19? A number of risk scores have been developed around the world but a lot of those that have been developed were developed in, they were developed in places where there's been a lot of COVID-19. So the United States, the United Kingdom, China early on. Um, and we had a real question about, can those scores work in our Canadian population? And so we looked at all of those scores, uh, uh, the ones that perform well in other populations, we brought them into our Canadian cohort. And we found that in fact, there are several risk scores that can predict in hospital mortality quite accurately with about 80% accuracy with just a small number of predicting variables so that this is these are tools that can be used at the front line by clinicians to have more informed conversations with people to help them understand what they can expect. They can be used by governments and hospitals to ensure that we direct resources to the people who need them the most. And this is really the promise of big data and predictive analytics that Dr. Phil thought and Dr. Hill talked about. So that's a high level snapshot of the summary and I'll hand it over to Dr. Razak to speak a little bit more. Thanks so much for that, Dr. Verma. It was amazing and I can't wait to see the rest of it published. I really wanna know more details about it. Um, as you said, we'll turn it over to Dr. Razak now. Um, Dr. Razak, I think you guys are also working on some other big projects. Do you wanna tell us a little bit about them and how they'll impact patients? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Dr. Philpoff, for joining us. And it's, it's great to speak to the OMA again. Um, so um, uh, Dr. Verma highlighted a really great example of how a large data repository and big data can quickly generate information that's informative for the health system. In this case, how should we optimally care for patients with COVID-19 when they're hospitalized? The idea of turning data into knowledge and then that knowledge influencing practice has been described as the learning health system. And we see this as a virtuous cycle in many ways. If you're able to pull data out efficiently, harness it rapidly for analytics, you can directly influence the care of the patients that we're seeing in our clinics and in our hospitals. And by doing that, we can then generate more information to learn about how to do it better the next time. And we see Gemini as one example, and, and the OHDP that Dr. Philpott mentioned is a broader example of how the Ontario health system can move towards this learning health system model. Next slide. 
I'm going to describe a few examples of how we've applied uh, this kind of data, and this is specifically the data from Gemini. Um, as the pandemic was starting early in the spring, one of the things that we really wanted to focus on was seeing how we could provide optimal care for patients who otherwise would end up in hospital from the long-term care sector. So as the pandemic was starting, we, want, we asked the question, could you provide high quality acute care at the long-term care centers? And what resources would you require to do that? In order to answer that question, we were able to harness the Gemini data set. And we were able to look at thousands, tens of thousands of admissions over the last few years, patients who were transferred for long-term care to hospital. We were able to look at the kind of medications they need, the kind of diseases that they presented with when they were transferred, and then rapidly with collaborators across the greater Toronto area, put together the LTC Plus program. This is now running at more than 50 long-term cares in the greater Toronto area. And it's basically virtual support for on the ground physicians, anticipating the kind of resources that they would need if patients were being transferred to hospital. We're trying to provide the best possible care we can. And sometimes for some residents of long-term care, that means getting that care at their long-term care and not being transferred to hospital. Next slide. We mentioned the learning health system, and this is a great example of how it's not just about deploying a program, it's about learning from the program and evaluating if it's effective. This is a snapshot of the data dashboard that we evaluate in real time that's drawing information in from those long-term cares and from the hospitals to look at the impact of the program, to look at the usage of the program and see where we can improve. Next slide. This is a second example. So one of the important phenomena that we've observed during the, especially during the second wave of the pandemic is the considerable variability between hospitals in the burden of patient care volume. So some hospitals within our system, notably within the Peel region or in the Scarborough region, have had extraordinarily large volumes of COVID admissions on top of their pre-existing large volumes of patients. And it's really caused considerable strain. A really innovative approach was developed um, by the government. And I should mention that the learning health system really requires multiple partners. And so physician leadership is part of it, but data expertise and government expertise is really part of it as well. And this is a great example of three groups coming together. So the considerable variability was being experienced by physicians and hospitals. Government leadership said, let's develop a model where we can start to transfer patients between high burden hospitals to, patient, to hospitals which are experiencing lower care burdens so that we can provide a more equitable access to care for people in Ontario. And then the data part comes in. And the data part is how do you optimally do that to allow those transfers to occur? And that's something that we've been able to inform using a big data repository like Gemini. Next slide. I'll give one final example. One of the major concerns during the first wave of the pandemic was hospital usage of personal protective equipment. Do we have enough? What kinds do we need? Um, this is really a data question. And we were able to work with uh, modeling experts from York University in this case to look at whether you could use the types of hospital encounters that typically happen to predict in advance the amount of personal protective equipment you would need to allow hospitals to have a better sense of the pipeline and the supply that they would require. And again, data shows that with uh, high-end modeling, in this case, uh, pretty advanced modeling uh, networks that have been developed, you can really start to predict and anticipate what you will need in the healthcare system down to the level of an institution. Next slide. So those are three great examples uh, on top of the striking data we've seen around COVID admissions and the comparison to influenza. We'd love to take any questions. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Razek. They are impressive, what's coming out of that big data and the Gemini project. Thank you so much for taking point on that. And thank you as well to Dr. Philpot Verman Razek for joining us today. So we're going to open up now to our Q&A session. To the reporters in the room, please put any questions you have into the Q&A chat. As usual, if we don't get to your questions in time, the media team will follow up with you to make sure that you get answers. You can also email us at media at oma.org with requests for additional interviews with any of the panelists or for further information. Finally, as per usual, we'll have a recording of this session available later this afternoon in case you wanted to capture part of it or reference back to it. So our first question will be addressed to Dr. Philpott, and this one has come in by email for us. So Dr. Philpott, 
How will the new Ontario Health Data Platform help the government and others make these kinds of pandemic decisions? Thanks very much for the question. So the Ontario Health Data Platform, as I indicated, is still in its development, so it hasn't reached its fullest form yet, but already it's allowing the kinds of decisions that and the kinds of information available that are similar to the work that you've seen in the previous studies, being able to get the kind of information that's necessary to determine who's most likely to uh, acquire COVID, uh, for example, who is most likely to get sick with COVID. There have been a number of studies using the platform looking at the risk factors associated with severity of illness. In its, mu in its much more advanced form, it'll be able to allow even further kinds of analysis based on, on uh, further laboratory information, radiological information, et cetera, and, and be able to not only influence the front lines of de clinical decision making, but those kinds of health system uh, decisions, including the transfer of patients from, from hospitals, one hospital to another. So in a sense, it's doing what the Gemini Network does does combined with the work that the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences is able to do, putting that together with even broader kinds of information that are available from primary care uh, providers who have a, a, a massive amount of data about the backgrounds of patients. It allows us to be able to identify risk factors better and uh, be able to, to know who needs to uh, receive the, uh, a particular type of care. Thank you. That's fabulous. It strikes me that I often talk about physicians and hospitals working in a very siloed fashion and this kind of networking, this kind of big data and collaboration between people is really going to enable us to address some of the challenges of the wide geography of Ontario and the various different resources across areas of Ontario. My second question will go to Dr. Verma. Dr. Verma, can you speak to, do we know if and how much of an impact lockdown has had on hospitalizations? Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Hill. I think that we can, so there, there have been obviously several now cycles in Ontario of lockdowns. I think we can speak with confidence from the first wave that the, the lockdown absolutely uh, helped us bend the curve uh, crushed the wave, as it were, and and uh, protected the capacity of our health system through the first wave. So that you know, in the summer, we had actually very little uh, COVID nineteen. Of course, there also seems to be an important seasonality of this virus, and um, and and that probably played a role as well. I think we also have now seen so uh, the important consequences of uh, the the most recent lockdown that began on Boxing Day. Uh, we know that in January, data from the modeling table that Dr. Brown presented uh, in, in his provincial briefings showed that we were really projecting quite a dire situation in Ontario's hospitals. Uh, and certainly as physicians who work on the front lines doing COVID care, Dr. Razak and I both, um, you know, have felt those pressures uh, and, you know, hospitals and, and our, frankly, our intensive care units are still very full and at capacity in a lot of, in a lot of hospitals. And it does seem as though the, the most recent lockdown uh, had an important effect in that wave not continuing. And you know, it does seem like we are hopefully on the other side of the peak of the second wave of COVID-19 of this pandemic. Um, and uh, you know, of course, in these complex environments with seasonality and other things changing, it's a bit hard to attribute causality directly, but it's pretty, it seems quite clear that that lockdown played a very important role. Uh, it's hard to know which pieces of the lockdown specifically were, were the most important in helping uh, shift the curve. And um, so that, that would be my response. I'll flip it over to uh, Dr. Razak to see, you know, he's on the Ontario uh, uh, Science Advisory Table. He may, for COVID-19, he may have some other thoughts on that. I'm happy to add a, a few more thoughts, but I think Dr. Verma covered it quite well. Um, I, I think that we are uh, very um, happy with the effect of the lockdown on the number of cases. It clearly was an enormous sacrifice for the people of Ontario to go through yet another lockdown, but I think the numbers reflect the really important impact that that lockdown had. What happens in the future, and I see there's a question around the impact of the new variant on this, um, what happens in the future remains unknown. Unfortunately, the modeling does predict 
that the, especially the UK variant, which is the most concerning of the variants in terms of infectivity, it's clearly more infectious than the Wuhan original strain of COVID. It looks like it'll become the dominant strain in Ontario probably within the next month. And it's clearly more infectious. And so as we start to relax some of the lockdown measures, whether we're going to see a rapid rise because of the UK variant remains to be seen. And I'm, I, I think it's great that in the most recent briefing from our government that they said they're gonna follow the numbers carefully. And that's the most we can ask, which is look at the rates of hospitalizations, look at the rates of cases, look at the intensive care use, and look at importantly, the number of new COVID, COVID cases per day. Thank you. That's brilliant. So I'm hearing that we're going to have a lot more information, but we still won't be able to predict the future. That's disappointing. All right. Um, the excellent question coming in from Pauline Chan, who I believe is a reporter with CTV Toronto, looking at uh, Dr. Verma and your fifth slide using risk scores to predict in hospital mortality. Can you explain a little bit more about those risk factors, how they interact? Um, have they already been used and what departments and what hospitals have done so? Thank you. Thanks very much for the question, Pauline. So the, the risk factors involved in the score is, is usually, so there, there are quite a number. We looked at seven different high performing risk scores, uh, which, have, which worked well in populations in the United Kingdom. Um, the, the three risk scores probably worked the best in our study in the Canadian population. They work with a combination of patient age, uh, the, the sex of the individual. As I mentioned, we know that it affects men somewhat more severely than women. And then a number of uh, measures like uh, someone's blood pressure at the time of hospitalization, uh, how quickly someone's breathing or whether they're requiring oxygen, uh, and uh, some laboratory tests. We know that COVID-19, the severity of COVID-19 seems to correlate with how much inflammation is happening in someone's body. And there are some lab tests that can uh, serve as markers of that inflammation. So a combination of, of, of a number of those uh, uh, factors, you know, somewhere ranging from in the simplest score, I think there's about five predictors in the most complex score, closer to 20. Uh, and uh, the combinations of those predictors uh, allow you to produce a fairly accurate estimate. Of, uh, I mentioned a roughly 80% accuracy. The nice thing is some of those scores can be automated within electronic medical records. The second piece of your question is uh, how are people using those yet? So uh, using those in Canada, is anyone using them live? Uh, so there are some risk scores that have been developed outside of COVID uh, for whether patients will get sick in hospital. Uh, and there are hospitals, for example, Humber River, Hamilton, uh, and our own hospital at St. Michael's that have general risk scores for internal medicine uh, or for sort of all medical patients. And they are, have been using those. And our study shows that actually those, some of those scores actually work reasonably well for COVID patients. So, so there are uh, uh, hospitals that use that information. Um, and uh, as an example, actually at St. Michael's Hospital, we have a very innovative uh, uh, score, which uses artificial intelligence to gather more than a hundred inputs from our electronic medical record and provides an hourly updated estimate of someone's risk. And that actually works very well in our COVID-19 patients as a risk score. It's one of the world's first artificial intelligence scores. So when patients come to St. Michael's Hospital and they are hospitalized right now, there is artificial intelligence improving the quality of their care on our medical wards, including people with COVID-19. Fabulous, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna throw this next question over to Dr. Phil Pott. Um, and apologies if it's a little bit out of your bailiwick, feel free to throw it back to the other gentleman if you'd like. But from Crystal Oag, I hope I pronounced that correctly, from Global News, how does the vaccine play out, uh, rollout play into the conversation and data? Do the variants play into this conversation and how does Ontario look at that? Thanks, it's a great question. I'll, I'll uh, take a go at it and maybe my colleagues will wanna add a little bit more to it. I can tell you a little bit from the background of the Ontario Health Data Platform and the work that we've been doing around trying to make sure we're gonna have the best possible information available. Uh, in terms of vaccines that have been administered and what the outcomes of patients have been. So uh, this was something that uh, there was a, a significant amount of effort that uh, uh, was 
invested in making sure that the right kind of data was collected at the time that vaccines are given so that we would be able to have a very large database going forward to be able to understand which vaccines are most effective, whether there are any uh, differences within vaccines, including the timing between uh, dosages of vaccines, for example. And of course, as you know, there are multiple types. So uh, when people are getting their vaccines, now I understand that in some cases, uh, especially in the early days that uh, data was not necessarily input immediately into the tablets that are necessary for the COVAX uh, data collection system. But uh, in some cases, it was, it was entered into that system later. But all of the information is captured at the time that people are getting their vaccines uh, so that we will be able to know who got what uh, vaccine when. Uh, and that will then, through the Ontario Health Data Platform, be able to be linked in uh, ultimately with things like viral genomics and being able to monitor uh, which variant might uh, have uh, a person might be found positive with if, in fact, they were vaccinated before and, and uh, what the breakthrough rate might be. So this is still a bit of a work in progress, I will have to say. Uh, it's not uh, at the state where it's providing uh, as much real-time information as available as one might like, but we will ultimately be able to have the information of literally millions of people in Ontario as to what vaccine they acquired uh, and what the, the protective rate was uh, in order as we follow people and line up the vaccine information with other information around uh, what their lab results might be and uh, which type of uh, variant they might have acquired in spite of being vaccinated in some cases. That's that's great. Um, Dr. Verma, Dr. Razek, do either of you want to add something to that? I, I can just briefly add that that's a, that's a beautiful example of the learning health system. And that's a great example of what was probably not even possible five or 10 years ago to take it from delivery of care, learn information about it, evaluate whether that delivery is effective, and then modify how you're providing care in real time. That's the best possible thing you can hope for from the health system. I couldn't agree more. And I kind of feel a little bit bad for medical students coming in now as to all of the extra things they're going to have to master going forward. But it's very exciting for patients and for our population health. The next question is going to come from Matthew Bingley at Global News. And he's asking, with respect to the data available, and especially concerning the rise of VOC spread, He'd like to know whether you think the province's plan to ease restrictions now is the right move. And I'll break up his questions into a couple of different parts. So let's tackle that first. Um, Dr. Verma, I saw you take yourself off mute, so go for it. Well, I took myself off mute to make a quip that at least now medical students don't have to memorize everything because computers help them Google things. So there's what they, they've saved brain space in one area and they need to develop it in others. So, um, uh, but I guess I've walked into this much more controversial question by taking myself off mute. Um, what I'll say is that, uh, you know, without commenting specifically on government plans, what I'll say is that um, uh, the government's uh, modeling table and Dr. Brown specifically commented that the modeling suggests that the variants of concern, and as Dr. Razak mentioned, specifically the UK B117 variant, um, pose a real risk. Uh, and that we there's a need to keep the reproduction number actually quite a bit lower given how much more infectious this variant is in order to avoid a future wave. Uh, and so um, uh, I'll, I'll simply say that the government's own modeling tables do suggest that uh, we are at risk of having a third wave. Uh, and that's a, that's a very real, the, the conditions for that currently exist to, to sort of set off a, a future third wave. I see Dr. Razak has his hand. I could I couldn't agree more. I think I hope everyone here knows that we put out a news release yesterday, in fact, questioning the data that was being used to make these plans. We all know that you know everything is hard. It's a pandemic. It's all first time of trying to incorporate all of these informations and make decisions. And I will give credit up the wazoo until the the cows come home, as they say, but it is really important to make those decisions based on science, evidence, and data when you have it. And uh, obviously, there are concerns. Dr. Razek, did you want to add to that? 
I'll, I'll just briefly add that I, I think um, Matthew's question is really important in the sense that it asks, is it the right move? And questions of what is the right thing to do sometimes are not the same as the question of what is scientifically expected. So we scientifically expect from our modeling that the UK variant will become the dominant strain in the next month. And that as the lockdowns are eased, you'll start to have a rise in cases or potentially a plateau in cases, but most likely you'll start to have a rise in cases. But there's clearly a trade-off. So keeping kids in school, the effect on small businesses, the mental health of people in Ontario who continue to be in a lockdown in the middle of a Canadian winter. And that's where you're really talking about values. And I think it's very hard for science to tell you what is right in that regard. Science can tell you what you would expect, but then it becomes an important societal conversation about what the trade-offs are. And I think from a scientific perspective, the best that we can do on the science side and on the modeling side is to continue to provide accurate data to help inform the value discussion. That was so beautifully said. I couldn't have said it better myself. You're absolutely right. There's more to take into account than just one aspect of this when you're in a real world solution situation and the, ch the challenge is real. Um, Matthew also asked, is there anything about the current timing of easing restrictions that is much different than the fall? Cold weather pushes people indoors and it's colder now than it was in the fall. So with the lack of vaccines and variants, aren't the ri risks of another wave just as present now? And I feel that like we may have mostly addressed that, but does anyone want to add to it? Going once, going twice. So I think Matthew will sum it up as saying the risk is still there. Um, it's certainly more prevalent than it would be without the new variants coming at us. But the truth is the new variants are coming at us. And so we will have to follow it daily and weekly as we've been doing to figure out what the next steps going forward are. Dr. Philpott, did you want to add to that? I, the only thing I would just say, I mean, I think the question itself gets at the fact that, that, that we, there really are multiple intersecting variables here and it becomes uh, highly challenging to be able to, to you know, determine the weight that should be given to each of those variables, including temperature changes and seasonality. Uh, but, you know, there's no question that we've come uh, a significant distance, even in the short number of months since the fall around the kinds of information that's being available and how it's being used. So uh, the kind of system that Dr. Razak spoke about, where hospitals are now uh, using this kind of information to make decisions as to where patients uh, may or may not be transferred, so that there's a fair burden on, on systems across both, not only across the greater Toronto area, but right across the entire province are things that we weren't doing four or five months ago. Uh, so that, that the system is actually continuing to become more sophisticated so that we, we are able to, to make sure that people get the best possible care and that there's not an excessive burden put on certain parts of the system uh, to the, the greatest extent possible. But uh, uh, we, as you said earlier, we still can't predict the future. We don't know uh, what the weather's gonna do. We don't know when vaccines are going to be available and which vaccines will be available. So we're still you know, uh, dealing with circumstances where not all the information uh, is at hand, but what this kind of data does is allows us to be able to manage that uncertainty and, and uh, make the best possible predictions. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I see two more questions have come in from media, one from Crystal again. So with respect to variants and vaccine rollout, what exactly are the concerns going forward? We have mentioned that the UK variant may or is likely to become the dominant strain in Ontario by next month. What are the impacts of the slow vaccine rollout on this? And I'll flip that over, I guess, to Dr. Verma in a minute. I will just mention that in our last media briefing, we did discuss how we thought there would be coverage of the new variants with the current existing vaccines. And I think that's an important thing to remind people, as scary as these are and as evolving as the situation is, the work that's been done up until now still stands. And so Dr. Verma, will you take it from there? Sure, I'll, I'll comment briefly and then uh, hand over to the others. I think your point is exactly right, Dr. Hill, that, uh, that we, we can take heart that thus far, the vaccines do seem to be uh, uh, reasonably effective against the variants of concern, especially the UK variant. There is more concerns about the South African variant and vaccines potentially being less um, effective there. Uh, there is also what we know uh, from the, the vaccine technology, there's an ability to modify vaccines. And I think we could imagine that 
in, in the future. Uh, there's likely to be a scenario where, you know, like influenza vaccines, you have an annual uh, updated vaccine. I wouldn't be surprised if periodically we have updated COVID-19 vaccinations. I think there's a there's there remains a question about you know previous infections and how that affects future immunity against the variants of concern. So there's lots here around the science that will will need to be sorted out. And I do think that the um, Ontario Health Data Platform has something really important to contribute there, which is that you know it's it's unlikely that people are going to repeat randomized clinical trials. Um, that have already been proven to, to, you know, effectiveness of these vaccines have been proven uh, historically, they're not going to repeat the trials for, uh, for variants. And so we need observational data. We need the ability to monitor the performance of vaccines and uh, monitor uh, uh, the, the effectiveness of vaccines and other treatments uh, to see how they work for new variants. So I think the ability to have that learning health system is really highlighted by the fact that we are facing lots of variants coming, coming down the road. Um, and so that I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Razak uh, to see if there's anything he wanted to add. Yeah, uh, I'll just, <clears throat> I think uh, Dr. Verma summarized um, uh, what would be a, a, a rational scientific uh, approach to dealing with the fact that new variants are arising. Um, I would just say a couple of other points uh, very briefly, which is that uh, the recommendations from public health, from physicians, uh, from the OMA about the individual steps that people can take to reduce risk are as true and as important with the new variant as they were with the original Wuhan strain. So reducing the number of exposures that you have to other people, wearing a mask, uh, limiting the number of times you leave your home to things that are essential for your day-to-day -day function. Of course, people need to get things like groceries or get other essential goods. Um, that should continue for now. We're clearly at a tenuous point in the pandemic still. There is an extensive vaccine coverage yet for the population, and we're still in the middle of winter time, which enhances the spread of the virus. So individuals in Ontario, um, you know, please continue to take all those steps that you've done over the last many months because they are very effective. Thank you for that. I feel like you're doing my job for me. I appreciate it. Reminding everyone about the public health guidelines. I have to say, I recently, uh, made my peace with the fact that the children and I are not getting anywhere this winter. I had kind of hedged on March break, maybe doing something. And I'm just like, you know, we're in Toronto and I just can't, I can't justify bringing that anywhere else, not even within Ontario. It's just not fair to the rest of the population. So you're right, it is really hard, but we have to keep doing exactly what we've done for the last year, because whatever successes we've had have been based on those actions. We haven't seen the success of the of the uh, vaccine yet. We will, but we haven't seen it yet. Dr. Philpot, did you want to add to that before I move on to the next question? Um, I see that Dr. Verma has his hand up there, so I, he, he it looks like he has something to add. I'll let him go first. Thanks, Dr. Cohen. I just wanted to quickly add that um, the increased transmissibility of the potentially of the new variants does highlight that although there remains important individual responsibility for everyone to do what they can, it's also important to focus on things like workplace safety for essential workers and ensure that in our, uh, you know, we're physicians, we come from the healthcare space, so our hospital workplace practices um, being up to speed, we've, we've seen hospitals be an important focus of um, uh, outbreaks, uh, especially among staff you know, who are having shared lunch spaces and things like that, which are so crucial in, in the winter to make sure that people have space to, to uh, be able to eat their lunch and take their break, right? So I think healthcare uh, settings, but then also, of course, non-healthcare essential workplaces, ensuring workplace safety um, and other congregate settings, whether that be our long-term care facilities or also uh, where fortunately, at least we've made quite a bit of progress on vaccination, I would say. And that's, you know, one of the good news stories around that. Um, and, uh, but, you know, thinking about other congregate settings as well, homelessness, uh, homeless shelters and, and things like that. I think it's important that we as physicians and, and health professionals continue to advocate for system and organization level interventions. Uh, in addition to uh, calling on Ontarians to continue doing everything we can as individuals, which I know we all have been doing. Absolutely. Thank you. And we are coming close to the end, but I think we still have time to add a couple more comments and answer a couple more questions. So Dr. Philpott, did you want to add to that? Go ahead. You can go to another question. That's fine. 
All right. So the next question comes from Tylee Taggart at MedPost. And Kylie's asking if there are any similar data platforms being developed and used in other provinces. That might be an unfair question, but I'll throw it out to anyone on the panel who has an answer. Well, I'm happy to take that one. Uh, so uh, the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, I think you know Ontario is in, in sort of a bit of a catch-up situation, but you know hopefully Ontario will will leapfrog, uh, and I think is leapfrogging with this this work that's being done. But uh, it speaks to the fact that. To, to be the very best, these kinds of health data platforms and uh, systems in which we can use uh, sophisticated uh, advanced computing technologies um, need to be done in as broad of a space as possible. And, and of course, in Canada, we always face our lovely federated relationship with other provinces, but um, British Columbia is probably the, the uh, province that up until now had the most uh, well-developed uh, health data uh, platform that would be somewhat comparable to what Ontario's has. And more recently, we're seeing at the uh, national level that there's a, there's a lot of movement with uh, the new Digital Research and Infrastructure Organization, NDRIO, um, which uh, will hopefully offer the promise that provincial uh, data platforms will increasingly be networked together. There's an enormous amount of work to be done in order that we can actually make those uh, talk to one another to the level that they should. And certainly around the gathering of health data, uh, especially during the pandemic, it has accentuated to us again that we have really struggled in this country to be able to have uh, national standards for, uh, for data so that people, systems can speak to one another in ways that don't require a whole bunch of background information to, to be able to map uh, the results together. There are, of course, European countries that are far ahead of what we've been able to do in terms of being able to have very large health data platforms that have allowed this kind of work to be done in the past. Um, it, I, one cannot underestimate how complex this is in terms of being able to address the privacy and security risks that are associated uh, with putting together massive amounts of personal health information in a way that uh, is safe and secure and people's privacy is protected. Of course, all the information is disaggregated and de-identified, uh, but uh, I, I would have to say that uh, an enormous amount of work has gone into this in Ontario in the last uh, nine months. And I think that's really gonna position us well to have, as I say, the, the largest uh, collection of health data sets in the country, but we will certainly um, be continuing to encourage a high level of collaboration across provinces. Absolutely. I think that collaboration across provinces is akin to the collaboration that's happened to create it within the province, right? You're just trying to get all of the pieces of data into similar places so that the questions, the harder questions can be answered. I think this will probably be our last question, um, unless someone has something burning um, from Sne Dougal, if I've got that right, from QP Briefing. So Sne has asked if we'd expect to see something similar during the second wave. What are some of the factors that we think could possibly affect hospitalization, mortality, ICU usage, or length of hospital stay during the second wave versus the first wave? I feel like that's a little bit of a predict the future question, but I'll turn it to the people who are in the business of doing that. Dr. Rozek, do you want to take a first stab? Um, sure. So. Uh our best available evidence suggests that the same risk factors that we saw that drove hospitalizations in the first wave will be just as important in the second wave. So there's nothing to suggest that the pattern of illness or the susceptibility about who gets sick enough to require hospitalization has changed in a meaningful way at this point. There are improvements in treatment, which is really encouraging. So we now have a very effective treatment with a high potency steroid. So our ability to treat when someone is sick enough has improved and there's hopefully more options on the horizon. But in terms of the risk factors that lead people to get hospitalized, I think things have largely stayed the same over the last 12 months. You will see outbreaks continue among the most susceptible groups. And that especially in, includes the elderly and those who are in long-term care. And uh, Dr. Verma raised a really important point about workplace related outbreaks. Those will continue to be a risk factor as long as there are as long as long there are settings where a lot of people are in a small space at the same time. If I could just add one thing, Dr. Hill, which is that um, seeing the OHDP, you know, Dr. Philpott described the innovation in the last year. Um, I, I think it's just important for 
uh, people like Dr. Verma and I to recognize that this has been a promise since we were medical students. And we are now seeing within a 12 month period, something rapidly get pushed forward. And it's, it's a good news story. And I think something that should be recognized because Ontario, Canada, many other large countries have wanted something like this for a very long time, but it's actually happening now. Thank you for flagging the good news within COVID. It always seems like there isn't much, but today's news release certainly does flag a lot of good things that are happening as a result. Before we close, I'm gonna let everyone take a stab at this last question, which is really, I think, around one of the pieces of data that you pulled out from your study that seems to have gone a little bit undiscussed today. And so my question, my question to the three of you is given what your study showed about people under 50 or 50 and under, what message would you like the public to hear today? Dr. Razik, you go first and then we'll switch it over to Dr. Verma and we'll let Dr. Philpot have the last word. Um, so I, an incredibly important finding from our study, and I think probably one of the most important for the public to hopefully hear from the results of this work, which is that it is clearly an illness that can be quite severe in younger people. We don't understand yet from a health system and from a physician level why one individual gets really sick and another doesn't, but it's very clear that you, if you are that unlucky individual that has excessive immune response to the virus, that drives really the most severe symptoms, um, it can be very consequential even if you are younger. And so it just really, again, highlights why limiting exposure, limiting spread is really important. Dr. Irma? Thanks, Dr. Hill. I think the, the most important single message for people to take away from our research, from what we know about COVID-19, is that this is a has the potential to be an extremely serious, severe illness, much more severe than influenza for people of all ages. And it leads to long-term health consequences. Uh, it has a very high rate of death. Uh, and what this speaks to actually the, the previous question, which was a slight difference in the, the two waves of the pandemic. The second wave of the pandemic in Ontario started in younger people. It started in younger people at the early fall, uh, end of summer, and then spread to other age demographics. And so pr most likely the demographics of people being hospitalized in the second wave skews younger than people in the first wave. And we see on the front lines, people who are in their 40s and 50s in intensive care units on ventilators. And many of these people will survive because uh, you know, the survival rates are better in younger people, but they will also live with long-term health consequences of COVID-19. So I think there's no question. I think it comes back to the, the point that we made and I made in the initial presentation. COVID-19 is much more severe than influenza. COVID-19 affects older adults more severely, but it is still has the potential to be very serious for younger adults. And, and if I could add, uh, Dr. Hill, Dr. Verma and I have now both personally cared for patients who got sick with COVID in the first wave of the illness and how, who have been repeatedly hospitalized afterwards. And both of us have had some of our patients die now who were affected way back in March, but just couldn't clear the long-term effects of COVID. Thanks. That's something that we'll definitely have to have more discussion about at some point, the long-term consequences as they become more and more visible and clearer. Um, it is very clear that the stories that we were hearing early on about long-term lung disease and other issues related to COVID um, are very real. Dr. Philpot, la Philpot, last word on this, please. Well, when you're thinking about the effects of COVID on young people, I want to give a shout out to a particular group of young people that I don't think have we've heard enough from, and that is our trainees. So all of us are in the business of medical education. Our medical students, nursing students, rehabilitation therapy students are desperately needed and it's, de it's uh, incredibly important that they can successfully complete their education. And they are the ones that have been working on the front lines, have been following all the rules. And while yes, some groups of young people have been the ones that have been responsible for some of the outbreaks, our health profession students have been highly responsible. We've had 
almost zero cases here in Queens of any of our health professional students acquiring uh, COVID uh, and because they know how much we need them to be able to get through their education and anything that causes a setback in their education is really critical. Uh, there's a serious shortage now of nurses, as you know, across the province. So um, I want to just, you know, acknowledge the fact that, uh, yes, not every young person in the province has followed the rules as well as they uh, could have, but we've got a group of young people that are working very, very hard under enormously difficult circumstances to be able to, to be the future physicians, future nurses and others in our province. And uh, I want them to be acknowledged as our final thought. Thank you so much for that. Again, could not have said it better myself. The trainees from all of the allied health professionals and physician community have shown up in so many ways during this pandemic. And of course, I can't speak for all of them, but I know the medical students have shown up in PPE drives and in things that are really not their job. They've offered childcare and they've tried to support physicians across the country, um, even with meals at one point delivered to the hospitals because that was where they could help and the sense of community within physicians, um, including students and residents and trainees was not lost on them. And it's important that as we go forward, we honor that contribution and we honor their dedication because it's certainly been a very challenging year for training. And I suspect the next year will be as well. All right, with that, I'm going to take the second last word and remind everyone who's listening that some of the highest rates of vaccine hesitancy are found in the youngest groups of population, that 25 to 45 gap group. And in that age group is the same group of people that we've just heard about being significantly affected with long-term consequences and still having a mortality risk. So we don't have the vaccines yet, but if you're on the hedge, if you're on the fence and hedging about whether or not you want to get the vaccine, start thinking about it now, have some conversations with your doctor, look out to the public health websites, the OMA website about vaccine information and COVID information, and try to find some resources from very well vetted information sites, as opposed to finding it on social media, which really doesn't usually do the complexity of it justice. With that in mind, I'm going to thank all of the reporters for attending today's briefing and for the amazing questions that have come through. As always, I hope the session was helpful in informing your reporting and I look forward to watching and reading your coverage. Again, if there's a topic you'd like to hear doctors discuss in the future, feel free to send along suggestions to media at oma.org and we'll certainly take them into consideration. Thank you again, everyone for your time. Stay safe, stay healthy.